Good evening. Uh, welcome to the seventh uh, Qamran Jam annual lecture at SOAS, which is organized by the Center for Iranian Studies. Um, the lecture series started uh, back in 2012 uh, with the first four devoted to Persian literature. Uh, after that, we decided to switch course and start addressing Persian history for the simple reason that another uh, sponsor, Ehsan Yar Shater, a lecture series uh, also started by Center for Iranian Studies, uh, took up Persian literature uh, delivering uh, biannual lectures. Uh, and we thought this is a good opportunity to diversify and foray into Persian history a uh, topic which is of uh, close and intimate interest to scholars of Iranian studies uh, here at SOAS and also more broadly speaking. Uh, for those of you who attend some of our seminars and uh, conferences, Iranian studies at SOAS uh, has a long history, but we're especially proud, especially proud of the fact that back in 2010, um, eight years and a bit, uh, we set up the Center for Iran Studies under the rubric of the London Middle East Institute in order to galvanize expertise and scholarly interest at SOAS on the subject of Iranian studies broadly defined. And I say broadly defined because Iranian studies at SOAS spans not only languages and culture uh, of the country, but also uh, areas of humanities and, uh, uh, and, and social sciences, including economics, development, uh, regional and international relations, law, etc., etc. So for those of you who uh, are interested in Iran, who care for Iran, and I think it's fair to assume that this probably applies to everybody here, which is why you're here, uh, this is a special moment uh, for us in our annual cycle of offerings uh, to focus on a very interesting topic and one that uh, has been uh, little studied. Uh, and I know you're here to listen to our uh, eminent speaker, Professor Turaj Atabaki, or Turaj as I know him, uh, who, and it's a great pleasure for us to be able to host him. He was here actually literally two months ago at the beginning of December uh, as part of another conference we had on Iranian, the role of Iranian intellectuals in Iranian history. So he is no stranger to SOAS, and it gives me special pleasure to be able to host him tonight to talk to us uh, about social history of uh, Iran's oil sector uh, and give us a perspective of history from below. And this will be over two evenings, as you know. The programs uh, you have, I'm sure, uh, collected uh, give you a summary of uh, his CV, which is uh, very impressive. Uh, he's written a lot of books. He appears in various media. He uh, commentates on Iran's not only history but also uh, current affairs. Uh, he's a speaker of Turkish, uh, Russian, Persian, of course, and, and, and English. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's uh, going to be uh, speaking in English, of course, um, for about an hour or so and there'll be an opportunity to put questions to him and uh, pick his brain in regards to questions that we may have uh, at the end. We aim to finish by seven because normally there's another group here waiting to come in. I'm not going to give you a long uh, introduction to him and his CV because he's rather well known and also you will find this here. Uh, Iraj, very briefly, um, is a renowned uh, scholar of uh, Iranian studies, and particularly uh, of uh, Iran's social history. He graduated uh, in theoretical physics, and then uh, diversified into history. So you can see he comes from a very varied background. And he's written several books, which I won't read through. You have the list there. And uh, he has been at uh, uh, the Institute of Social History, International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. And uh, he has also supervised a group of PhD students on topics relating to Iran's economic and social history, especially in the first half of the 20th century, a period that requires a lot of uh, scholarly attention. Um, Turaj uh, 
uh, has also coordinated the research project on the social history of the 100 years of labor in the Iranian oil industry, uh, which was funded by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. What she is going to address for us here tonight, therefore, draws from many, many years of his intensive uh, and intimate study of the archives. Uh, and when I say that, I know that he has, he has had access and he has studied archives in the old Soviet Union uh, and Turkey and uh, various other places. So we have before us an eminent social historian of Iran, uh, somebody who presents to us one of the best traditions of Iranian studies, and it's a great pleasure to have him here tonight. Just before handing over to Turaj, uh, I want to say something about the Comran Jam and your lectures. Uh, in 2011, SOAS was awarded a generous gift by the Feridun Jam Charitable Trust to promote Iranian studies. And the funds, which exceeded two million pounds uh, as endowment, have been utilized uh, uh, carefully for this purpose. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, partially at least, we have the pleasure of uh, offering around 50,000 pounds annually uh, scholarships to further uh, studies at BA level, at master's level, and also PhD students every year in the last uh, five or six years. Maybe some of you are already uh, scholarship holders or are studying uh, BA, Persian, or master's Iranian studies. So that is uh, thanks to the generosity of the Feridun Jam uh, trust. Um, another part of the same fund has enabled us to hold these annual lectures. Uh, so uh, the uh, generosity of the uh, Jam Trust has, uh, uh, I, I have to acknowledge and uh, we are very pleased that uh, thanks to that generosity we are able to uh, have Turaj tonight. In the last uh, few years, uh, when we started with uh, Persian literature, we had the pleasure of hosting Professor Karimi Hakkak, who initiated uh, the series. Then we had Professor Dick Davis, and we had uh, Leili Anwar, and we had uh, uh, Michael Barry, uh, some of them in this same lecture theater. And it's a fitting uh, venue because it's also named after another Persian benefactor, David Khalili, uh, David Nasser Khalili. So we know it as KLT. Uh, this is really Iran room. There's another Iran room upstairs, which is called DLT, and that's Jam Lecture Theatre, where we would have the lecture tomorrow night. Incidentally, the lecture tomorrow night starts at 7, not at 5.30, like tonight. And there'll be a reception prior to that from 6 o'clock. Details are here. So, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Turaj to the podium and uh, join me in showing appreciation for his presence. Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening. It's a very great honor for me to be the lecturer at the Comran Jam Annual Lecture Series. And I'm very, very grateful to my very dear friend, Professor Hakimian, inviting me, and very uh, grateful to awarded uh, hospitality of Miss Hosking. Uh, my lecture today and tomorrow is on social history of oil industry last for the period of 75 years. And uh, this is when the oil was discovered in Masjid Suleiman in 1908, and I'm covering the period up to the 1978 Iranian Revolution, the 70 years. So the periodization, what I do in presenting my talk, is different from a a political historians, you know. I'm a social historian, I'm a labor historian, so my periodization is different. So 
there are certain uh, episodes in this history which some people they find it very very interesting but uh, those who are engaged with politics but for me is irrelevant as a social historian so you know bear in mind that this evening I'm covering the discovery of the oil and I bring it to the the Second World War and then tomorrow I cover Second World War to the Iranian Revolution. So uh, let me to start with an introduction, say that the long 20th century has been often called a century of oil. An ample and uh, reliable supply of oil and its byproduct contributed to the remarkable growth in the world's economy. Although this contribution was not always even, oil and gas still uh, contribute to more than 55% of total global energy. And although their expanding consumption has caused irreversible damage to the planetary ecology, Nevertheless, both still are considered as the most valuable and widely merchandised commodities in global economy. The yet worrying fact is that despite widespread assessment that the new source of uh, renewable energy such as wind, solar, and hydroelectricity are eminently due to replace fossil fuels, our reliance on the earth curse may go on for longer than what had been anticipated. While the scale and importance of uh, petroleum and its derivatives, its economy, its strategic implication are still, are all incontestable, nevertheless, the great complexity of its extraction and processing that rely on labor and expertise of men and women working across the numerous sector of this industry often overlooked. In the United Kingdom, of the total 300 plus employment supported the UK upstream oil and gas industry, the core of offshore workers reached to 22,000. In Iran, of 150,000 employment in the Iranian oil industry, the core of the industry working class is about 110,000 today. The oil industry in Iran has been formed within the network of several interwind formative relations that have undergone major changes over the course of 20th century. Labor relations in Iran, especially in the key industrial sector, have been crafted by a series of changing relations between the national state and a major colonial entity like Anglo-Persian, Anglo-Iranian, BP, or uh, the later on, I mean, consortium comes in between, or between the national state and uh, the local and national labor force employed in the industry or between the oil company and its employees. So we have got a different layers of relation. These relations at different historical conjuncture have affected both labor and labor relation in substantially diverse ways and levels. While the history of oil in Iran is mainly dominated by political history refashioned through Eurocentric 
structuralist, functionalist theory of modernity, which represent a top-down view of state-society relations, the study I carried, the study I carried out at the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam, uh, together with my PhD students, drew on the reciprocal impact of modernization and social change in both regional and global contexts, but from below. Not top down, but bottom up. The project I researched and coordinated, a span of 100 years commencing with the discovery of oil in the southwest Iran in 1908, which opened a new chapter in Iranian labor history. I did it together with four PhD students. I look forward to the publication of their th research thesis soon. Each of them covered a certain period of a long hundred years. My own research, different from them, which hopefully will be ready soon for publication, covers not only labor history, but it goes beyond labor and embrace culture at its broadest definition. So let's go now to, after this long, rather long introduction, let's go now to the core of my talk. Let's see how the oil was discovered. At the turn of 19th century, Discovery and control, the discovery and control of reliable and secure major deposit of oil was one of the main challenges of British uh, enterprise worldwide. Imperial Russia at that time owned uh, the Baku oil field, which at that time was the second largest known oil deposit in the world after the United States. This ownership equally gave Russia control over the emerging and expand, expanding new energy market. The British competitor were keen to change the situation by discovering and mining uh, new oil field around the world. In May 1901, William Darcy, an Australian entrepreneur, supported by the British legation in Tehran, uh, succeeded in gaining a concession from the Qajar king, which gave monopoly right to search for obtain, exploit, develop, render suitable for trade, carry away and sell natural gas, petroleum, asphalt, and ozocrite throughout the whole extent of the Persian Empire, with the exception of the five northern provinces for no longer than 60 years. Seven years later, in the early hours of a spring day, May 26, 1908, following months of exploration and excavation in the southwest of Persia, one of the wells in the foothill of Zagros Mountain, not very far from the ruins of Tahte Suleiman, the party in Tahte Suleiman, finally struck the oil. After its success in discovering oil deposit, the immediate task facing Anglo Persian oil company, as it was known then, was the considerable challenge to transporting oil from the railhead to the market in crude or refined form. To maximize profitability 
The company decided to reform the oil within Iran where the proximity of the Persian Gulf offered the Anglo-Persian oil company easy access to international market. Along the coastline, Abadan Island in the northern, northern, northwestern corner of the Persian Gulf, on the other side of the waterway Shatul Arab, or as it was later named Arvand Route, offered final encourages for shipping tankers, it seems Abadan is a very likely place, an ideal location for, the, for building the refinery. The construction of Abadan refinery began in October 1909. Three months later, in the January of 1910, an ambitious project was launched to construct some 220 kilometers of pipeline to transport the oil from the field of Masjid Suleiman to Abadan. A massive construction effort took place subsequently, opening up a new chapter in Iranian labor history. Roads were built along with pipeline, an old refinery, shipping dock, and the entire company towns. And with its absolute monopoly of oil mining, production, marketing, the Anglo-Persian oil company undertook a grand labor recruitment campaign in the region. Its workers were drawn primarily from the tribal, pastoralist, and village-based laboring poor. Those the first generation of those who joined the oil industry. This new workforce was subjected to advanced industrial labor relation and labor discipline. In due course, it's led to the formation of the first cluster of the working class in the Iranian oil industry. As the new workforce was recruited for the expanding oil industry, rapid industrialization and demographic change occurred too. The oil town affected virtually all social relations, social organization, and government administrative structure at the local and national level. At the beginning, it seems the construction, the, the conscription of labor would not be a burden for the oil company. Easy, very easy. But, however, soon turned out the recruitment of labor was by no means an easy, as it was not as easy as the company had anticipated. In a region, you are living in a region where human needs were few and cheap to satisfy. It was not so simple to persuade young men. Women were excluded during this period. It was very difficult to persuade young men to exchange their traditional mode of life for industrial milieu with radically different work pattern and new kind of labor discipline. I like this picture very much. Is that here? Yeah. This one? 
especially this. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> a typical Bakhtiari. Uh -huh. And don't forget here, I come later to this. So let's start I mean, talking about recruitment. Production had to be carried out in a region where the Persian central government could not assert its sheer authority. And that was a tricky business. The company realized quickly that in order to proceed, it needed the blessing of the chief of local tribes, especially the Bakhtiaris, <coughs> whose cooperation was essential to guard the company against possible attack by the pastoral nomads and peasants accusing the oil company of stealing and seizing their land. The consecration of the tribal cheese was also vital for supplying the workforce, the workforce the company badly needed. The first group of the Bakhtiari who joined the emerging oil industry at the railhead or protecting the company's property as guards were the coming from the lowest rank in the tribes. They call it Amale in a Bakhtiari tribe. I mean, don't mix it with what we use as the Amale today. In the, the Bakhtiari, they're known as Amale or Amal Konande. I've written in extent the reason, of, the, the, the background is Amale in one of my work. And the status Amale, plural Amale Jot, applied to the individual nomads who, who provided the logistic requirement of the tribe. The tribe laboring poor, the Amale, who had no herd, no, had no, or owned small flocks of few sheep and goats, and then when they joined uh, the oil industry, formed the main bulk of unskilled labor for the oil industry, these Amale. I mean, if you go to the Bakhtiari tribe structure, I mean, they're part of the group, I mean, called Amale, and they're under Amale, they are divided to different sections, I mean, Tofangchi, Tubrechi, and the rest. But they call it in Bakhtiari as Amale. They were laboring poor in Bakhtiari. They joined them in the oil industry. But that was unskilled labor. How about the skilled labor? For example, when you go to carpentry, masonry, painting, this is all done by the Isfahanis. Isfahanis, skilled workers. They came to Abadan and to Masjid Suleiman. The Indian workforce compromised the main trunk of the skilled labor in oil industry. The early cluster of the Indian migrant workforce who joined the Persian oil industry were transferred directly from the Rangoon refinery in Burma through the coordination of the Rangoon Oil Company. The Rangoon Oil Company was established in the late 19th century, it was almost 20 years older than the Iranian oil industry. So they had them in the establishment of the British. So the first time they went to the Rangoon, and they, 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 they recruited some skilled labor from the Rangoon I mean, oil industry. And they, 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 they took it to, the, to Abadan. Uh, in Persia, working workers originating from Burma were categorized as Ranguni distinguishing them from the other Indian migrants. Because Rangunis, these were Muslims, not, Christ, not, not Hindus, these are Muslims. So the Rangunis in Abadan, they were a community, they formed a community. They had their own mosque. That was segregated from the other Indian mosque, the Sunni and Shiite mosque of Indian. 
in the Kali, the most still, still standing in Abadan is called Ranguni Mosque. So this is a reference to a substantial population of Rangunis in Abadan. So with the foundation of Abadan refinery in 1909, a number of Indian migrant workers steadily increased. These are the numbers of 1910 to 1950 comparing Iranian and Indian European. But the number of the Indian labor steadily increased. Part of these uh, the, the figures you can see here, I, I took it from the BP archive at Warwick University and partly from uh, Delhi and uh, Mumbai National Archive. So you see that the in Indian employment is changing in the, from 1910 to 1950. So uh, recruitment for the migrant labor from India continued and even increased significantly. Uh, but that was despite the problem of desertion by workers in pursuit of better job or the restriction of the Immigration Act, which remained in force during the First World War. I mean, for those of you who are interested in to study migration, this is a very, very interesting chapter. The, the British Raj has got its own Immigration Act. It's a 600 pages, every detail there. And that was a problem for the Anglo-Persian oil company to take easily labor from India to Abadan, to Masjid Suleiman. So they had a negotiation between, there was a conflict between British Raj and London, and, and Abadan, of course. So uh, by the end of the war, First World War, the Indian migrants at work in Persian oil industry were the sole way they were coming from all across India. Chittagonian workers worked in harbor, engineering, and naval transport, while the Punjabi Sikhs chiefly employed as driver uh, technicians and security agents, migrants from Madras presidency occupied the clerical functions, Ghazars from Punjab working as a doobies or wash, washermen. It's very interesting. Doobies or washermen done by the, by the Ghazars from Punjab and Goans were cook and servant. You know, in, uh, for those of you who are Abadani, you know, I interviewed Abadanis, still they remember in the Hafar, these were still, I mean, these were still, I mean, in, you could see these, these blocks in Hafar. This was done by, the, these are the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, Ghazars from Punjab, washing the labor's clouds. They, they call it Baylor suit in Abadan. So that was a, a story of Indian migrants in Iran. Okay. If I have a glass of water. In the formative years of the Iranian oil industry, there were numerous reports about individual workers uh, who simply deserted uh, the site after only a few days of work. I mean, who cares? I mean, this is, I don't like here. I mean, life in, in tribe is much better than here. Good, good climate. Why, why should I work here under the direct sun? I'm not crazy. So they deserted site after a few days of work without even prior, giving a prior notice. To overcome this problem, the company adapted some special regulation. For wage, for example, one of these was wage payment. Instead of making a daily payment, they decided to give fortnightly payment. And in rupees, in Indian rupees, not in Persian, in Iranian rials. At that time, it was rupees. 
This was the first measure implemented by the old company to ensure the uh, continuity of work. These are the payday, and these are the monies here standing for the laborers. Bakhtiar is standing there. So now another point was long, the working day. Long working day and modern time measurement were among the method of labor discipline introduced by the oil company. In the oil industry, the daily production period was divided in two shifts, where each shift consisted of a 12 hours working period. Given the absence of watches and clocks, the only way to make the workers conscious of uh, time discipline uh, in the workplace was a horn or klaxon that was usually mounted on the top of a towers. Twice a day, the horn was sounded to indicate the start and finish of the working day. This horn known in oil industry as Feidus. They call it Feidus. Why Feidus? I think it's coming from the term Fagotist, the bosom player. The Feidus hooted at 6 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening. In 1929, the workers of Abadan refinery launch strong to improve their working condition and pay. Among the demands was the reduction of the working day to seven hours in the summer and eight hours in winter. Now, you've got the working day, you've got the money, wages. What are you going to do with money? So for the majority of those labor coming from their pastoral life, the wages of itself could do little to keep them in service unless opportunity provided for purchasing with the wages those commodities and comforts not obtainable in a nomadic life. It was not enough to give money way of spending the money had also to be provided. A local market or bazaar where the workers could spend their wages buying food, clothes, utensils, tobacco, ornaments, among other things were set up. The first such market was established in Masjid Suleiman. The migrant from Shushter were the leading vendors in this market, in this bazaar. Now, changing. Abadan and Masjid Suleiman is, com Masjid Suleiman is coming as an old, as a company town, and Abadan is expanding. Prior to the, uh, to the discovery of oil, Abadan was an agrarian island with a scattered population of Arab tribes who had settles in several villages. Masjid Suleiman uh, was a newly founded oil company town built around oil field that straddled the migratory routes and spring pasture of the Bakhtiari nomads. Migration to Masjid Suleiman either to seek employment in the oil industry or to provide services to the, its employee, push the new city's frontiers outwards. An oil field town originally accommodating a mere 523 employees in 1910, it grew up blips and bones into a company town with a population of 17,000 around 1920. That was Masjid Suleiman. 
the population of Abadan grew to an even greater extent. In 1917, we had 5,000 residents in Abadan. And uh, this 5,000 in 1917 was included the oil company employees, local population, shopkeepers, petty traders. By the end of the war, in world migration to Abadan of people seeking work in the oil industry and providing services to the oil workers caused Abadan to grow beyond all expectation. By the mid 1920, the population of Abadan Islands had reached 50 to 60,000. Let me now open a new chapter in this talk. First World War. <coughs> what First World War did to this industry? The First World War ended to somehow ironically labeled long piece of 19th century. The war singled the breakdown of international system that had built around high finance and the culmination of industrialization of warfare after an era of intensified capitalist competition and new technological development. On the eve of the war, the global shift from coal to oil that was 1913, the Germans started before, but the British started in 1913. The global sh the shift from the coal to oil uh, resulted in exponential growth of the demand of the petroleum products. The extraction and refining of the significant and affordable supply of petroleum was the underlying prerequisite of the global shift and the Persian oil industry uh, as is, uh, and its main uh, industry run by the Anglo-Persian oil company with the British government uh, which had uh, the main was main uh, shareholder since 1911 became the uh, very very important foremost supplier of this new energy in the world and in the, in the world beyond the Persian Gulf. Persian oil uh, not only became an economic resources of fundamental importance to the British interest worldwide, but it also uh, turned to become a, a strategically military asset. Uh, during the war, the Persian oil industry uh, expanded greatly and, uh, and it succeeded in becoming one of the main oil producers in the world market. Yet there were major uh, drawbacks and hurdles as well during the war. Uh, first of all, obviously, there was a security issues. Uh, here, we have got a problem. Uh, the, the, the here was... This doesn't work. It's finished. Now, if you just look at there, I mean, Abadan is close to the uh, Ottoman Empire. So, at the beginning of the war, the Ottoman and German they tried to, uh, to, 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 to sabotage the oil industry, and uh, they did. 1915, they blew up the, the, the pipeline there. So you've heard about the uh, German activities in a southern Iran during the First World War. So that was one really a major problem facing the oil industry. Another problem at the war time was scarcity of the labor. Because who's coming to work next to the front? So 
desertion was a common practice. Not only skilled, work, skilled workers, but unskilled workers too. I've written on that using the archive of Delhi. You know, we had these Indian prisoners made their labor for the British Empire during the First World War. Some of them, I mean, they were forced to continue all the work even in the oil industry. The criminals. So that was really an issue in, 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 in the First World War. And we had them in this uh, fight, as I told you, the, the German, they wanted to sabotage, and the Iranian were, the, the, the British were, they were very, very uh, careful about them and what to do. But when, when they reached Basra in the first year of the war, that was really made everything easy for, for the oil industry. But the, 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 the Turks and the Germans moved to other part of Iran to uh, Baluchistan and Sistan. And something not done, and uh, I'm happy to find it out about this in uh, Turkish archive that uh, the, 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 the Turks, uh, they did uh, some, uh, I, I found it in the, the, the military archive in Ankara that uh, the, 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 the Turks, they, they managed, I mean, the Ottomans, they managed them into uh, blew up the British installation in the Hark Island. They had a secret service called Teshkilata Mahsusa, and the Teshkilata Mahsusa did this. Anyhow, uh, the, what, this is the war time. When the war finished, that was another problem. The outcome of the war was as drastic as the war itself. Uh, let me to recall that what Habsbaum called the First World War and its aftermath, the age of catastrophe. And he argues that its destructiveness was caused by its similarity to unconcealed competitive capitalism, which has no ultimate aim except limitless accumulation, acquisition, and global expansion. The conflict engulfed the general public as a conscript workers and the cannon fodder and ultimately made them pay for the cost of the carnage. But at the same time, this is very important, not only for Britain after the First World War, but also for Iran. But at the same time, and ironically, the First World War, the very scope of the war brought with it, with, with it the expansion of public sphere and in advertently opened up a new venue for greater political participation by the working class and common people. Those of you who are familiar with the history of the working class in this country, you remember what happened to the working class in this country, in United Kingdom, in Britain, right after the World War. The radicalism of the labor movement in 1920s in this country and the other side of the, uh, the, 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 the sea in, in the country that I'm coming from, the Netherlands. We had the, the, the first major labor, mass labor, labor movement there. Uh, the, this important Historical political shift overlapped with the global structural development in cooperation capitalism, in, cooperative, in corporate capitalism, forcing the state and large uh, corporations like Anglo Persian Oil Company to view labor and labor relation in a new perspective all together. In this new configuration, industrial working class could not longer be seen as a merely anonymous producer of surplus value, but increasingly as a human, human capital, and ultimately as a political citizen whose vote and political and, and uh, whose vote and action was 
could, could affect laws and policies. This was a shift, you can see, both in United Kingdom, in Britain, and in Iran. When the First World War finished in Iran, came to an end, Iran was still uh, entangled in post-constitutional revolution perplexity. The political atmosphere of the post-war one Iran was characterized by the wave of anti-colonial nationalism, reformism, radical regional movement, and an area of new social movement that included collective action among wage and craft workers. You know, this is the beginning of the labor, very intensive labor movement in Iran right after the First World War. And that was definitely, can be said about the embryonic industrial workers in the joint oil industry. In December 1902, now it's coming to the action. In December 1920, some 3,000 Indian workers of Abadan oil refinery stage strike. Their demands included an increase in wage, reduction of daily working hours, additional pay for overtime, improvement of sanitary conditions, and an end to vilification and molestation of workers by staff members. They were soon joined by the Iranian workers, which forced the refinery authorities to accept some of their demands, not all, including accommodation, medical service, leisure, amenities, and others, all forgotten. It was therefore to be expected that uh, this workers' discontent would flare up again soon, and it did. It did. 18 months later, 18 months later, we had a second strike, mass strike in Abadia. Again, initiated by the Indian workers. In May 1922, the Indian workers broke out, which was soon joined by the Iranian workers. There was a report, very interesting report about this strike written by George Thompson, an employee, employee of Anglo-Persian Oil Company in 1922. And he recalls that the strike was well organized protest by the skilled artisans involving about 2,000 Indians. The immediate reaction of the oil company to the strike was different from the first time. In the case of the in Iranian workers, the company, Anglo-Persian oil company, called on the local authorities to arrest all Iranians. Sheikh Ghaz al did. And then, as far as the Indian were concerned, the Anglo-Persian oil company decided to repatriate them, to send them back home. 2,000 strikers, American workmen were forced to, they were, were forced to this, this, this repatriation. The strike leaders refused to board the ship unless all the strikers could leave Persia at once. And the oil company reluctantly conceded their demand. In doing so, the company lost a large part of its skilled workforce. Needly to be said that the majority of these Indian who were repatriated were Indian Sikh. That was a turning point for the oil industry, Anglo-Persian oil company because they, there was a, a sort of radicalism coming to India. 
So they were quite, I mean, uh, careful, conscious about what's going on. And don't forget, we are in 1920s after the war, and we had the Russian Revolution. This is, this is something happening in North Iran. And this labor movement, global labor movement, all over the world. So what to do? So they said, let's reduce the number of the Indian workers. And if we go for the Iranian worker, they might be easy. So, and that was in fact I mean, part of the Darcy project. When the Darcy signed the, this agreement with the, with the, Anglo, with the Iranian government at that time, one of the conditions was that the, 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 the company uh, had to uh, employ Iranian workers gradually and replace the Indian or the, the non-Iranian by the Iranian. But that was overlooked before and during the war. Now after these two consecutive strikes, we have got another story. The, the story is to what they call Iranization or Persianization. At that time, Iran and Persia, I mean, was, I mean, used, I mean, not Persia as far as, but Irani. Uh, Persianization or Iranization of the, 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 the world workers. So they tried, I mean, to uh, go for that. And this is the same time, when you look at the Iranian history, this is the same time that we have the coup d'etat of 1921, one of Reza Khan. So there is a new page in Iranian history. And he comes, Reza Khan comes with the Persian territorial state nationalism and the emergence of a new political society during the war. So if you have got a political society, this is a man of order. He's laying on this territorial state, authoritarian nationalism. So on the other hand, we have got the labor movement too in, in the oil industry. So we should take all these uh, the, the, the dimension, all these criteria into account. When in 1920s, Reza Shah Pahlavi rose to power, his new rule promoted territorial state nationalism to glorify the authoritarian modernization program and the new state building project. According to Anglo-Persian oil company, when Reza Khan visited the oil industry in Abadan in 1924. He was a still Reza Khan, he was not Reza Shah. When Reza Khan visited the oil industry in Abadan in 1924 as prime minister, he was deeply disappointed when he did not see a single Persian employee in Abadan refinery. He was very much disappointed. And on return, his administration put pressure on oil uh, uh, company, improve working and living condition in the oil industry and accelerate Iranization by training indigenous workers and replacing Indians by Iranians. On the second visit, that is very important, on the second visit, that is four years later, Reza Shah, now he's a Reza Shah, visited Abadan in 1928, and he was crowned as a Reza Shah, and he declined to visit the old installation despite the old company's highly preparation to welcome him. He said, I'm disappointed. You didn't fulfill your promises last time I was here. Still, there's no Persian Iranian labor here. So that was put pressure on 
oil company, all these elements I said, I don't want to just go to this essentialist view to put it on one, one, one corner, the, 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 the pressure from the Iranian government, but we had the other factors. Finally pushed on the Iranian uh, or the Persian oil in this uh, Anglo-Persian oil company to go with this uh, training schemes. Uh, the Indian mentor uh, supposed to be coach and training Iranian workers. But that was not the whole story if I don't tell you about what was happening in among the workers in the oil industry itself. How was their reaction to this policy of training? It's very interesting. <laughs> the Iranization of uh, labor in Iranian oil industry was not solely, solely from the top. There was a very solid dissatisfaction amongst the Iranian workers that uh, they believe that the oil company is practicing discrimination when it comes to new labor recruitment and when it comes to promoting the existing labor. The most, the very most explicit example of this prevailing discontent was during the course of 1929 strike. On May 1st, 1929, that was International Labor Day, about 9,000 Iranian workers at Abadan oil refinery launched a mass strike. Their demand included an increase in a wage by 15%, recognition of the workers' union, and May Day as a legitimate holiday reduction of working day to seven hours in summer and eight hours in winter, and complete, this is important, and complete equality between Indian and Iranian workers. You don't see here anti-Indian sentiment. They said equality. This is workers' demand. You know, regarding, I mean, the, when I come to the reaction of the state and the, the, the Tehran, is different voice, but the Abadanis, they want equality. It's important. So uh, the strike was initiated mainly by the Iranian workers, and the Indian workers did not participate. This time, they didn't participate. In fact, I mean, there is a report. I found it very interesting. When the company's uh, uh, security guard uh, were there, uh, protected. The, guard, the, the company security that protected a Rangoonie uh, workers who wanted to uh, break the picket line and go to work. <laughs> so now it's changing. Okay. Uh, the the, the Anglo-Persian oil company claimed that the strike of May 1929 was nothing but a Bolshevik plot to ferment intense labor trouble in the oil industry and ultimately ablaze southern Persia. That is their word. However, but, but I mean, I, 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 there is no trace in the Russian archive, in the Soviet archive. I went through all the Comintern archive of this period. There's no trace that the Comintern knew about this. There was somebody who studied at Kutf before and went to Abadan, and he was Yusuf Eftekhari, and Yusuf Eftekhari was there, but Yusuf Eftekhari didn't have any connection with Comintern at that time. The link was broken. And something else I found it very interesting, you might, those of you, you, you know, we're familiar with the Iranian left history, it's very interesting that it was after the strike, when the strike finished, the Comintern, Moscow, Comintern, decided to send somebody to Abadan to give a detailed record of, uh, report of the strike. Because for them was, wow, we didn't expect that. And you know whom they sent that? Just guess. 
Mikhailian Sultanzadeh. Sultanzadeh was there. I found the passport of the Sultanzadeh in Comintern archive. Yugoslavian passport. He traveled there. And he wrote very interesting report about this strike. Okay. Uh, so that was that. But in Tehran, I mean, there was a very different. I mean, the press in Tehran was very supportive of the strike and accused the oil company of downplaying the true cause of the labor discontent. The oil company was accused of practicing racial discrimination and there were complaints that its Indian employee ruled over Iranians. And don't forget, at that stage, in the very beginning of the strike, Taymur Taj also supported the strikes, and the governor of Abadan. In a Shabname or nocturnal hand out distributing through this period, we read the following. Our crowned father, government and court officials. The Iranian workers are glorious and noble sons of Daryush, who had to suffer under the tutelage of British and particularly their Indian clerks and middlemen, sacrificing everything for the interest of the Anglo-Persian oil company. This was one of the leaflet distributed by the, uh, the, 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 the some, 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 some strikers. Then we had, of course, I mean, the new agreement of 1933 signed between the Iranian government and Anglo-Persian oil company, which put an end to the Darcy concession of 1901 and emphasized the earlier demand that the oil company should, be, should recruit artisans, technicians, commercial staff from among Iranians. In the opinion of the Persian press, very, very different from what we heard after the war, Second World War, during the Second World War in Iranian parliament, accusing Taqizadeh of signing this agreement. What we heard at that time at the Persian press was that uh, they, they welcomed the cancellation of the Darcy concession, and they said this is a political emancipation and a new page to Persian honor. Not only did it return to national wealth to country, but also ended the lengthy era of favoritism towards Indian employees. <coughs> so that was the war, and that was labor activism in this period. Let's go now to, for, to Abadan itself, the city. This is a map I found it in, uh, from in, in, in British archive in, in 1926, and I added something myself. Those things that you see here, I added myself. In the early of the operation, the Anglo-Persian oil company offered temporary housing exclusively to its European staff. Two years later, in 1912, when the construction of the refinery was sufficient, uh, uh, sufficiently near completion to allow a trial run to be made, the oil company's European employees were accommodated in a brick villas and bungalows supported by gardens surrounded by gardens. Uh, these houses were built at the northwestern site of refinery and called brain, brain bungalows. Uh, before that was a brain was a Sheikh Hazal uh, residence was also there. On the opposite side of the refinery to the southeast and north of the old village a new neighborhood was constructed for Indian clerks and artisans. And they were called, the, uh, that was a buffer zone uh, between refinery and the bazaar. During the early days, 
this new neighborhood was called Cooley Lane or Sitch Lane or Indian Lane and there were, we had these parallel long uh, round houses uh, in Nissan Hoot there for the Indian. And uh, each bridge was divided by the wall uh, to accommodate several employees or families. The families was hardly a lot to join the Indian workers at that time. Uh, Iranian uh, were uh, mostly lived in the sun-baked mud houses in an old village around the Sheikh Bazaar. Uh, loosely lashed by the stick of bamboo's roof, by palm leaves and things like that. That was, that was how the Iranian lived at that time, the Iranian labor. Uh, the new labors were, two new labors was later added to Abadan in early 60s and uh, in uh, Ahmadabad Lane and Bovarde or uh, Indian Quarter or as call it Quarter Hindiha. And uh, Indian Quarter was uh, meant for the Indian semi-skilled workers and security agents. And uh, they were quite, I mean, far better than the accommodation provided for the Iranians. Uh, Abadan really was a, what they call it, I mean, usually, I mean, there are, I mean, some, some, some discussion among the, the city planner and city uh, his history of the city planning that uh, they talk about the colonial entities of these cities uh, and they call it a dual society. When the society, when the dual city, when the city is divided between the colonial and non colonial. In my opinion, that's not, we have another category. I call it triple society, triple city. Abadan is a triple. We have got the British, Indian, Iranian. So this is this this triple entity of Abadan is quite interesting. You have got this, the the British. Unfortunately, no. I think this is this is this is you 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 have a brain 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 bungalows here, and then you have a refinery. Here you have this uh, Indian uh, Indian and Cooley Lane Sikh Lane here. And then the rest are uh, the, the Iranian. But later on, the Indian quarter was also added here, but was mainly the Iranian here. So the, the, the Abadan is a triple city. That's my opinion. It was especially divided according to social stratification principle uh, imposed by the British colonialism. Uh, hail, uh, highly uh, stratified a racial uh, hierarchy existed, which uh, the oil company, the oil company's uh, British employees brought with them chiefly from India. And this is something I covered in another work that there was a conflict, but there was a two generation of uh, statesmen at that time you could see emerging New statesmen in Britain, in London, and the old man coming from the Raj. And they've got conflict. Even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in this country was divided between the old diplomats and the new diplomats. And gradually you see the finger of the Labour Party in everywhere. Don't forget, we are talking about 1920s of the Labour radicalism. So this is something that you see that the, everything was divided. It's still, I mean, the, the, the oil company was dominated by the British Raj administration. So uh, this is this is how the, the, the city was divided. The, 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 okay, crossing the very rigid uh, racial partition was possible. Uh, for example, when uh, there was a high-ranking Indians 
or later Iranians, um, they, the, 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 the attended official ceremonies, congregation, worship services with European community. It was possible to cross the segregation border. It was possible. However, mixing across, uh, across uh, racial border was uh, specifically discouraged. And segregation was held up, up to the best, as the best alternative. Let me to give you a, a very, very, for me, interesting story on how this segregation practiced. Uh, in the Anglo-Persian archive, Anglo-Persian oil company's archive, I found the document from 1926, a memorandum signed by Mr. Armstrong. He was the oil company's executive in Abadar. Uh, and according to the memorandum, uh, when some Indian clerks uh, uh, working at the old company approached Mr. Armstrong in Abadan to get permission to use the library that the old company had in Abadan in Bray. Can we use your library, the library of the company? The Mr. Armstrong reaction was very, very interesting. He was reluctant to give the permission because uh, he said that I'm worried if I give the, the permission, if the permission is granted, then our European stuff would not be in ease to use this library anymore. So the advice of Mr. Armstrong is that why not use our used old book and have your own library, Indian library. Okay, the Indian said, okay, fine, we do that. So they get them in some old and used book, and they had their own Indian library. OK, but this is not the end of the story, because in colonial culture, racial segregation <laughs> had a domino effect. And some years later, the Iranian, they approached the Indian and said, can we use your library? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, some of them now can read English, Persian, so they, they said, can we use your library? And the Indian reaction was that, oh, no. You can use our used and old books, and you have your own library. <laughs> so this is how the, this, 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 you know, this colonialism, uh, uh, colonial culture, is that's got a domino effect. So, this is that, uh, this is, let me to uh, bring this uh, 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 talk to this end by giving this uh, story. And um, to just sum it up, it lets me to say that what I did in this talk is um, to follow the old industry, labor history from below, and to see that how Amale became Karajar, how labor became worker from 1908 to 1940. And labor discipline was imposed, was practiced. But my studies of the formation of the working class in Iranian oil industry, I let me to say that I distinguish four layer of analysis is very unconventional compared to the old, what we call it, old labor. My approach is a new labor. In my new labor, I distinguish four layers of analysis, those of structure, way of life, disposition, and collective action. In my reading, it was through this process that Amale became Karajar labor became worker. And when we reach the Second World War that I will cover tomorrow and finish it for the, before the revolution, let me to just say that an eyewitness account of what was happening 
bef before the Second World War. This is done by Elvin Sutton, who served as a staff of the Labor Administration of the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, and later he was a press attaché in a British mission in Tehran. And he says that uh, the war, the Second World War, uh, was a source of big relief for the Anglo-Persian oil company. For eight years prior to the occupation, British management and staff had been wrecked by the painful necessity of considering Persian susceptibilities of paying lip service to the national rival dimly observed in the rest of the country. Many fundamental change has taken place. Persian numerals now shared proud of place with English on the back of cars and the gate of bungalows. First and second staff had become senior and junior grade. Third class remained third class. The letter BP on the petrol pump, it turned out, stood not for British petroleum as everybody thought, everyone thought, but for benzene pars, the petrol of Persia. Thank you. Thank you.